Coming up on Market to Market, a high court throws water on a battle over farm drainage. President Trump uses the art of the deal on policies that affect rural America. And opposing forces find common ground fighting for the Mississippi River. Those stories and market analysis with Darren Newsom, next. We have a real problem on Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, January 27 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. The economy shuddered a little at the end of December as orders for big ticket items dropped off and the trade deficit widened. The gross domestic product grew 1.6% in 2016, its worst showing in six years. Orders for goods lasting more than three years fell four-tenths of a percent on fewer contracts for military aircraft. Without the winged warriors, orders rose half a percent. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average went over the psychological 20,000-point line midweek and stayed there through the final session. Water treatment plants are sometimes tasked with handling an increased nitrate load, a portion of which is blamed on farm field runoff. Midwestern farmers have been waiting for the outcome of a federal court case that lays blame for this water pollution directly at their feet. On Friday, the plaintiffs in the case were dealt a major blow. Josh Bittner has the details. Upholding a legal doctrine going back a century, this week, the Iowa Supreme Court rejected a claim by the state's largest utility seeking $1.4 million in financial damages in an ongoing federal lawsuit. The Des Moines Water Works case claims farm fertilizer runoff in three counties upstream of its primary water source are to blame for excess nitrates it must remove to provide potable water for over half a million customers. The utility operates one of the largest nitrate removal facilities in the world and says frequent operation of the plant is taking a toll on its aging infrastructure. Iowa Secretary of Agriculture Bill Northey called the ruling a significant loss for Des Moines Water Works and an expensive, needless distraction from the agricultural community's push to improve water quality through collaboration, conservation, and science-based methods. The federal case is set for trial in June of this year, but the judge unbundled some claims and sent them to Iowa's high court for clarification. Waterworks had previously told Market to Market that once those claims were decided, they would be married together with claims pertaining to the Clean Water Act, which is enforced nationally by the Environmental Protection Agency. Specifically, the utility claims 10 agricultural drainage districts in Sac, Calhoun, and Buena Vista counties should be reclassified as point source polluters under federal guidelines. Traditionally, agriculture has been exempt from such status. With a track record of lawsuits against the EPA, President Trump's nominee to lead the agency, Scott Pruitt, could seek to restructure environmental laws and throw another wrench into Des Moines Water Works pending trial. Realistically, we have not been uh, particularly satisfied by the prior administration's uh, EPA uh, understanding of our claims. This is not a race to beat a uh, change of administrations. The courts offer an objective view of these kinds of issues without regard to the administrations that are in power. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. President Trump continues to turn several of his campaign trail promises into reality, including keeping Guantanamo Bay open, freezing federal hiring, and restricting refugee traffic. Josh Bittner has more from the White House on policies that will impact rural America. President Trump launched his first full work week by signing a bundle of executive actions with ramifications for rural America. Great thing for the American worker, what we just did. Organized labor hailed U.S. withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership in favor of bilateral trade negotiations. Responses in the agricultural sector were mixed. 
The National Farmers Union applauded Trump's move, calling TPP deeply flawed. However, the American Farm Bureau bemoaned the loss of potential markets valued at over $4 billion in annual export revenue. And the U.S. Meat Export Federation said it remained fully committed to trading partners among the 11 member nations of TPP. The president breathed fresh life into two controversial pipelines, Dakota Access and Keystone XL, delayed and all but defunct respectively as the rollback of Obama's legacy continued. In the case of Keystone, critics claim the maneuver gives the U.S. nothing in return after clearing an export path for Canadian crude across American soil. A media blackout and contract freeze at the Environmental Protection Agency irked some environmental groups who conceded overreaching regulations like the Waters of the United States rule may have helped deliver the White House to Trump. What's so concerning about this is that it didn't even get at the regulations. It just got at the funding structure that helps provide the research to provide basic scientific facts. On the campaign trail, the president had insisted Mexico would foot the bill for a wall on the border between the two nations. Generator on. After the election, that promise morphed into taxpayers picking up the tab. We are going to finance the, the Secure Fence Act, which is the construction of the physical barrier on the border. Um, we have ambitious goals and ambitious timelines. Our goal is to get these laws done in 2017. Congressional leaders are poised to spend $15 billion on the project, but after a scrapped meeting with Mexico's president, Trump announced a 20 percent import tax on goods from south of the border as another potential payment option. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Along the major river roads, environmental groups and businesses often butt heads. However, as producer John Torpy found out, those opposing forces have found common ground in their fight to balance protecting an ecosystem and making a profit. The Mississippi River is the lifeblood for agriculture in America. The ability for producers to compete on a global scale depends on healthy inland waterway structures. For decades, the intricate system of locks and dams has guided goods to global markets. During the years of the Great Depression, the United States Congress authorized the construction of lock and dams along the upper Mississippi River. The system was designed as steps for river tows and other crafts to traverse from Minneapolis, Minnesota to St. Louis, Missouri. Since then, barges traveling the vital shipping lane have increased in capacity allowing over 60 million tons of commodities to be moved annually down one of the most important waterways in the country. Many people working on the river are concerned that, you know, there's a point of no return, that we're not going to be able to provide the reliability that the industry has enjoyed for the, this 85-year history. But according to officials with the Army Corps of Engineers, the vast network of locks and dams have been falling into disrepair and they fear a major failure along the aging system is imminent. Army Corps data shows shipping by barge can save $14 per ton. To ship the same amount by rail would require more than 240 rail cars or 1,050 semi-trailers stretching 14 miles down the nation's highways. Those in the agricultural community and officials along the river see the efficiency of the system as a key to U.S. dominance in global commodity trading. In Davenport, Iowa, aging lock gates, crumbling concrete, and lengthy repairs plague operators. The Army Corps of Engineers in the Rock Island District points out that even though Lock and Dam 15 facilities are $400 million behind schedule with repairs and renovations, in 2014, they were able to keep over $3.5 billion worth of products moving up and down the Great River. Now it's more critical than ever that we make infrastructure investments in the lock and dam system because frankly, there is no other way to move this kind of volume of commodities uh, throughout the U.S. The case is the same on the Illinois River. At the waterways Dresden Lock and Dam, the repair bill has reached $300 million and is years behind schedule. 
but the facility manages to push $7 billion worth of commodities through its gates annually, making it the third busiest lock and dam in the nation. For businesses that make the mighty Mississippi River their office, infrastructure upkeep is a must. In La Crosse, Wisconsin, Brennan Marine has been running on inland waterways across the country for almost a century. The company employs close to 100 people in Wisconsin and about 400 nationwide. From lock and dam repairs to environmental habitat projects, the company has worked with the Army Corps of Engineers for more than eight decades, experiencing the struggle between what needs to be repaired and what will be repaired. The budget that the Corps has to work with in any given year uh, isn't enough to even scratch the surface of, of what is required with the aging infrastructure. You just got to get creative. In an effort to help alleviate high costs associated with lock and dam repairs and improve how quickly repairs are completed, owners of barge and tow companies along the Mississippi River imposed a fuel tax on themselves. When we got the fuel tax increase, it went from 20 to 29 cents, and that will have significant impact on speeding some of these projects up that are critical today, but weren't going to be funded for 15, 20 years. Over a decade ago, federal officials began to look at the issues facing the upper Mississippi River Basin. Congress tasked the Army Corps of Engineers with studying the U.S. lock and dam system and submit plans on how to confront the problems that might interrupt shipping. The Army Corps came back with the Navigation Ecosystem Sustainability Program, or NESP. The legislation ended up uniting shippers and environmentalists, two groups that normally sit in opposition to one another. Both found common ground somewhere between getting 60% of the nation's crops flowing down the Mississippi and keeping the river open as an essential migratory flyway used by 40% of the nation's waterfowl. And this was the first time we were going to really look at how do we put the two pieces together and walk, you know, um, in harmony together to try and get the river to a sustainable point for everybody, people and nature. The key to the measure was a dual purpose plan that called for every dollar spent on river infrastructure to be matched by a dollar spent on environment. While the measure passed in 2007, the work proposed was never funded and the plan to revive the Upper Mississippi River remains on the table. However, both parties continue to pressure the point on Capitol Hill. Environmental groups and navigation groups, along with labor unions, are supporting it. They're annually going up to Congress and on the behalf of, of NESP and you know, lobbying with Congress to support it. So it's a unique program when you look at it from that perspective. You don't have you know, the navigation and environmental groups at each other's throats, but they're actually working hand in hand to promote something that they see as a benefit to the river. While the Army Corps, environmental groups, and the navigation industry continue to fight for a sliver of the federal funding pie, time continues to tick away on the nation's locks and dams. It, it really has long-term effects for the economy and has long-term effects uh, for the nation as a whole that I think a lot of people just don't realize. We need to figure out how to have the river work as a healthy organism at the same time, and, and that's really where we're getting to today. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Next, the Market to Market Report. Concern over the future of U.S. grain exports and South American weather plagued the commodity markets. For the week, March wheat lost eight cents, and the nearby corn contract moved seven cents lower. Despite weekly export sales being in line with expectations, Trump administration policies on China helped squeeze 18 cents out of the March soybean contract. March meal cut $5.70 per ton. In the softs, March cotton added 216 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, February Class Three milk futures lost 31 cents. The livestock sector took it on the chin as the April cattle contract fell $1.64, March feeders shed 3.83, and the April lean hog contract dropped 18 cents. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index was off 16 basis points. Crude oil lost a nickel per barrel. Gold declined 16.50 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index lost two points to finish the week at 397.30.
Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Darren Newsom. Darren, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. We're glad to have you, but before we get started, you can listen to our market discussion anytime by downloading our market analysis podcast on our website, iptv.org slash mtom. Darren Newsom. Yes, sir. Here we are, first week after the inauguration of President Trump. We have some things there that have impacted the market, but I want to kick it off with a true market discussion. Look at your favorite commodity, the wheat market. Okay. Wheat had a nice little run up. Mm -hmm. Have we peaked? If we want to start weaving our wonderful tapestry of depression this evening, yes, it's peaked. There's no reason for it to go up. Even if the dollar continues to break? Even if the dollar continues to break, we have too much wheat. I mean, that, that's just the bottom line. We have too much wheat. If we believe in the USDA reports at all that were released in January, and we'll get another round of them here in February, U.S. ending stocks of wheat, ending stocks to use, came in at 53.3%. 53.3%. Ending stocks divided by total demand. We can't. We can't throw it on oil spills right now to get rid of it fast enough. There's no, we have no trade partners. Nobody's wanting to buy it. The dollar, yeah, it's backed off, but it's still high, uh, particularly when you compare it to the euro, uh, to the Australian dollar, to the Canadian dollar, to all of these other currencies of our competitors, uh, Russian ruble, which is always fun. Uh, what are we gonna do with it? Okay, so we reduced acres by 3.7 million. Basis is still a buck under. Uh, it's a start. What we have to have now, uh, I've already heard reports from out in the Southern Plains that uh, some of it's starting to come out of dormancy. There, <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to say it the way I, I, it's going to come out, but their best bet might be if it gets frozen mm -hmm. again after it comes out of dormancy. But it still won't kill it. You can't kill wheat. So, uh, but it could be enough to maybe. How much, let's say we do get a large cold snap comes mm -hmm. in, starts to freeze off all of these, uh, these plants that are mm -hmm. not covered in snow, they've come out of dormancy, yep. we freeze, hard freeze. Mm -hmm. Market gets awful worried. Yep. What, from a chart perspective, what's the upside potential in a massive freeze event? There isn't any. Really? There isn't any. We've got almost 1.2 billion bushels of ending stocks for 1516, and that's if we can maintain the export demand that we have now, and we've already fallen behind pace. So. Let's say we start raising the interest rates like what everybody seems to want to do. And, the, you know, I know the president's saying he wants higher interest rates and a cheaper dollar. That doesn't work. If interest rates go up, the dollar's bound to go up. The sales that we aren't making in wheat, we're really not going to be making in wheat. Okay. I don't so see we're it, facing man. headwinds and they're just going to get stronger. Wheat is always facing headwinds. And, you know, unless there's some sort of crop disaster somewhere in the world, uh, Europe, somewhere. Okay. You know. We, the market just shouldn't, shouldn't move very far. All right, well, let's see if we can get a smile out of Darren Newsom here. And let's talk the corn market. We've been range bound. Mm -hmm. on the, let's talk old crop corn first. March yep. corn was looking at that 365 as a pretty tough ceiling. Mm -hmm. This week, we poked our heads up above it and we shot for that 370. Mm -hmm. What, from a technical perspective, does this chart, this 345 mm -hmm. to 365 chart, tell you about the corn market? What it tells me is that the demand market for corn is over. Because what we have done is that we've reverted back to the type of corn market that we saw prior to 2006, where we went months, years, in a long-term sideways trading pattern. That's what we've got. Right now, it's between 345 and 365. Yes, we poked our head above that top side. And from a technical point of view, you now flip that range, and that's your, that's your next target, 385, 390. Seasonally, corn tends to move up. Mm -hmm. Okay, all of that's bright, shiny, very happy, makes everyone feel good. Probably won't happen because we're also at this point rolling over the corn market, the corn, the corn trends, and it looks like they're getting ready to come down. What we have to have happen in corn is similar to what we have to have happen in wheat. We've got to find and maintain sales. Uh, in the December, excuse me, in the January quarterly stocks as of, uh, as of December 1, 12 billion bushels of corn. Yeah. 12 billion bushels. But phenomenal ethanol production, incredible okay. record-setting ethanol production. Okay. We're chewing up more corn per gallon of ethanol. Presumably. Right, presumably. Um, are, is that enough to provide some demand? One of our key buyers of ethanol is a little angry with us. China. Exactly. Um, weren't real happy. They weren't real happy when we threatened a tariff on their on imports from there. 
Um, so their first retaliation was in the ethanol sector. Okay, so are we going to continue to export? Are we going to continue to need to produce as much ethanol when what we're talking about here in the United States is overall energy, energy uh, demand is expected to go down again in 2017? Okay. Um, you know, the ethanol component of the, the, the three-legged stool of is demand for corn, domestic corn. Um, the ethanol was the consistent leg, the one that you could always count on, mm -hmm. 6.4, 6.5 billion bushels. From early nominees of the new president to, you know, war of words with China, how confident can we feel about that 6.4, 6.5 billion bushels going forward? Okay, now with that in mind, I want to take a quick look at new crop. Mm -hmm. We've seen that same range-bound trade happening, call mm -hmm. it uh, 370 to 395. Mm -hmm. Where do you see us going there? Do you want to be making sales at 395, or is there more potential for a weather scare to pop us over $4? Yeah, there's a, we're, we're going to get a weather scare. Okay. We're going to get a weather scare. We're going to get you know, reduction in acres. Something. Presumably this year it's going to happen. Uh, so we are going to get a weather scare June, July. Uh, it looks like we should be able to pop this market up Right now, volatility is just anemic. I mean, okay. if, if someone wanted to go in and buy some puts on this and walk away, they'd be perfectly, it, it would work. So you get your puts, you watch the market do its spring summer rally, you make some sales when it does that, get out of your puts, walk away. All right. You don't have a lot of uh, positive things to say about future Chinese demand, Darren Newsom. Soybean market. Exports yeah. were incredible this year. Are you of the camp that we have front-loaded those exports? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, and if we look, I mean, everyone talks about, oh, these sales are so great, the shipments are so great. If we look at total sales, we're running at 80, what, 88, 89% of USDA's projected demand, mm -hmm. which was 6% over last year. That's 1% better, one percentage point better than what we normally do. So where's this extraordinary pace? It's factored in. Okay. So now, what happens if we get into a trade war and all of a sudden the big C word starts popping up on weekly export sales and shipments? Cancellations. Right. It's a threat. Retaliation is real. So how aggressive do we need to be with new crop beans with the market up here, 1024, 10, north of $10, let's you say? You know, to me it looks like, to me, new crop beans have started to, to trend down. And, and if it wasn't for some of the other markets, they would probably be going down faster. Um, I think we're going to hold above 10 for a while. Okay. Uh, I think we're going to get a little bit of a spike here yet. But uh, as with corn, options are certainly a, a, a you know, pretty solid strategy in here. Volatility is still relatively low, and that's not going to be the case for much longer. Okay. Uh, and we could be looking at a real problem. Now, all that being said, I still think that USDA is overstating old crop ending stocks. Of course, I always think USDA yeah. is overstating old crop ending stocks. But they may not be this time if we do indeed get into trade war. Okay. Well, let's move on. Let's talk about livestock. Now, we did have a market that was higher on the week, and that's the cotton market. Mm -hmm. And Darren and I will discuss the cotton market mm -hmm. in detail in the Market Plus segment that you can find on our website. But right now, we need to go to live cattle. Okay. We've dropped a little bit, $1.64 on the week in the nearby. Is that just a correction there from that incredible rally we've had. Now, to me, it looks like the weekly charts turned down. The weekly trends have turned down. Uh, we had a nice run up, you know, big run up in the cattle market. Uh, you know, all indications here at the end of this week was that running out of gas, a little bit overbought, uh, probably not going to be able to maintain this buying, and that opens the door to sell back to the 112, 108, 104 range, somewhere okay. in there, maybe a little bit deeper than that, but but that would be where I would target. Feeder cattle probably going to follow right along. Feeder cattle follow right along. Uh, yeah, I would look for them to back off as well. On the, yeah, it's not the short term chart, but the secondary chart being weekly charts. I would say, you know, the, the the cattle markets in general should start to come under some pressure. Okay. Now the cattle market, we have seen a lot of volatility over the past two years. We've got a question from Jared McDaniel here. Mm -hmm. He wants to know where do you see the range or trend for feeder cattle yeah. futures over the next five to seven years, and is the cattle cycle still valid? You know, and, and it was an excellent question, uh, or it is a tough question, because as we all know, there, there's, you know, outlooks, long-term outlooks are basically meaningless, uh, particularly in this day and age when anything can change uh, the, the complete path that we're on. But if I look back at the monthly chart and I, and I see what we did from, say, between uh, 2007 through, excuse me, 2009 through 2014, that's when we had that huge run-up. And then between 14 and 16, we fell back. And everything was in nice five-wave uptrend, three-wave downtrend. And so now at the end of October 2016, it looks like we set our low. And we should now be in wave one, probably coming to the end of wave, wave one of the uptrend. 
So I think over the next five years, we're going to continue to extend that uptrend. How high could it go? Uh, it, it, probably not an average price, but I think at its peak, we could get to that 180 to 205 again. Uh, we're going to see the waves. We're going to see these moves within that time frame. Uh, but I think by the time this, this five years are up, we should see the 180 outside of shot at 205. Okay. Well, let's take a look at this lean hog market. Uh, you know, relative stability, down 18 cents on the week. We're still holding nearby in the upper 60s. The deferreds up a little bit stronger. How aggressive do you want to be making sales with the hog market today? Who's one of our number one buyers of pork? China. Yeah. China. Mexico's right up there, too. Um, I would certainly be using this rally. I'd be very nervous about this hog market at this How point. How far out do you want to be making those sales? I looked at the, uh, near, at the April contract, and certainly it looks like it's rolling over uh, on its weekly chart. So I think it's getting ready to trend down. I would probably say the same for the June and August, uh, even if, you know, possibly even going out as far as, 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 as this coming December, you know. Uh, now, do I want to stay short long term? No, but I think I do want to get some hedges in place, uh, get some coverage on with this constant uh, war of words that continues to go back and forth. Kind of get a feel for how this whole thing starts to materialize. Right. And, you know, it could all, you know, it could play out perfectly in the U.S.'s favor. There is that possibility. All right. Time will tell. Right. Well, Darren Newsom, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this week. Always enjoy it. Thanks, Mike. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market. But Darren and I will keep the market conversation going, including answering more of your questions during Market Plus, available on our website. While you're there, check out this week's M2M podcast, where one of our producers gives more behind the story on this week's Lock and Dam future. Feature, excuse me. And join us again next week when we'll look at how a plant disease is hammering Florida's citrus industry. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.